All right, we're back. So now I want to talk about HTTPS. And HTTPS has a, a very specific purpose. And that purpose is to protect against what are known as man in the middle attacks, right? Where you have someone who sends one message to someone else and then it gets intercepted. In older security textbooks and so on, the actors were always called Alice, Bob, and Eve for some reason. Um, so Alice tries to send a message to Bob, but uh, old mischievous Eve intercepts it. So that's what a man in the middle attack is. Of course, the pro um, this protection against a man in the middle attack is to encrypt the message of some sort, um, often with a key. This way, if Eve intercepts um, the encrypted message, or the, known as a cipher, she cannot understand it because she doesn't have the key. Of course, the problem is, how does um, Alice also send the key to Bob and have this key not be useful to Eve? That's actually a, a fairly tricky problem. HTTPS is an encryption layer that's on top of HTTP. It encrypts the HTTP header and all the content. It uses something called Transport Layer Security, or TLS. It's an improvement on the original um, secure socket layer, uh, SSL, but um, we often see the term just SSL used in the HTTPS context. Sometimes you see TLS slash SSL. HTTPS makes use of things called certificates. This is part of a public-private key mechanism that, uh, um, uh, which is how HTTPS works. I'm not going to go into the details of that. We have in our program a security course where that's covered in a bit more detail. These certificates, however, are backed by a third party, by certificate authorities, CAs. Your browser has a list of trusted CAs. You can, in fact, go in and see what list is there. You can add your own certificate authorities that you trust. You can remove others if you want. The certificate authority's role is to validate that the certificate is from someone who is who they claim to be. The certificate authority also issues and signs the certificate and it also puts in the, um, the public keys so that anyone seeing them can trust that these, are, that these are genuine. As I mentioned, in your browser there are many dozens of CAs that are trusted by default. So um, par um, part of the certificate is just plain text, including information um, potentially about the certificate's um, organization and where they're from. Um, some validation dates. <laughs> As you can tell from these dates, this is a uh, diagram from the first edition of the textbook. Um, there's also uh, a part where is the uh, the actual public key that's there. Uh, this is a it uses something called SHA-256, I believe, is the the hash of that key. Um, again, you can go into your browser. You can take a look at the um, a certificate authorities that your browser trusts. You can again decide to remove or eliminate some of these if you, if you so wish. Very few people do that. Um, your browser will also tell you a little bit of information if the certificate that is there is invalid or is timed out um, for, uh, for one uh, reason or another. Okay, where are these certificates come from? Well, they have to be purchased, generally speaking. And they're purchased, so if you've got a website, you've got your, your, your fancy website that, you, uh, that you've created and you want to have uh, HTTPS ability, and so you need to purchase some kind of certificate. So you can, there's typically three types, domain validated, organization validated, and extended uh, validated. I guess that should be validated as well. So the domain validated is certainly uh, the most, pretty much the most affordable option. Um, there's very little validation that actually happens from the certificate authority. It verifies that um, um, that the email um, 
uh, like it, uh, there's a communication via email using the, the email address that's listed in the Whois registration database. You may recall back in chapter one, I believe, in the book where we covered um, domain registration and how at some point towards the end of the domain registration process, you have to supply some contact information and that contact information goes into this Whois registration database that anyone can look at. Domain validated certificates are generally pretty inexpensive. Um, there's a wide range, fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars a year, sometimes less. Um, sometimes you see like uh, resellers selling ones for like thirty dollars or twenty dollars or seven dollars. So there's there's a, a lot of variance in terms of the cost. Um, Certificate authorities typically provide some kind of warranty, but domain validated certificates have pretty low warranties. And it's really quick. It's it's kind of an automated process, and so it generally can take like, you know, under half an hour, sometimes under 10 minutes to get a domain validated certificate. In the browsers, um in uh, Firefox, you uh, you get a little sort of um, uh, icon that you can click on, and it'll tell you uh, who the certificate's from. Um, Chrome, for some strange reason, has decided to try to um, um, uh, display less information. They have this sort of sense that their, their explanation is that uh, this should be the default, so no extra information is needed. You can, however, see um, more information about the certificate if you so uh, if you so need to. All right, the organizationally validated certificate. It's it's more. I clearly I didn't finish that sentence. Um, it's a little more expensive. Let's say. <laughs> um, why is it a bit more expensive? Well, the CA takes some steps to verify the identity of the organization getting the certificate. You may recall uh, on the previous slide with the domain. Uh, validated certificate. There's just a um, an automated check on the email. Here, with an organizationally validated, the CA will check like, are you a real legit organization? So this takes some time, and it's as a consequence more expensive. Finally, the most expensive of all is the extended validation certificates, and here the CA is going to uh, require that the organization prove that it's legally uh, it'll, it has to show some of its legal documentation in terms of, let's say, incorporation documents and things uh, along those lines. And then that information then um, uh, can be seen in the browser. And the idea here is that that, that can provide you know, more assurance to the user. So um, in Firefox or in older versions of Chrome, you um, uh, see the actual organization name right there in the location bar. You can click on that location bar, for instance, um, in uh, Firefox and see more information. Um, about a year ago, um, so maybe I guess sometime in 2019, um, Chrome decided that they weren't going to do that anymore. Um, and so they just show the same icon for an extended validation certificate as for a domain one. It's kind of strange. I'm not really, again, I don't really understand the rationale, um, their documentation, where they announced this. They just said, well, there should be nothing special about HTTPS. It should be the default. Be that as it may, um, if you do click in Chrome on the lock icon, you can see a little bit more information about the certificate and uh, you can drill down into it and eventually see um, the city and country and uh, uh, who supplied the, who who the CA is. These are much more expensive, as you can see. Um, some of them are very expensive. And again, why are they so much more expensive? Well, the CA is having to do a lot more work to verify um, your organization. <clears throat> By default, uh, a certificate's for a single domain. So maybe www.funwebdev.com, we might have a certificate for that domain. But 
other subdomains that we have access to uh, that we could create say for instance api.funwebdev.com um, are not covered by that certificate we can <laughs> we uh, organizations can however purchase wildcard certificates as it says here that these can be used on multiple subdomains but they are they're much more expensive but they're often the kind of thing that uh, an organization may want now some of you might have been looking at these last um, several slides and said wait a second I'm sure I've seen free certificates free certificates do exist and as it says here free is definitely the cheapest way to get uh, <clears throat> SSL so there's different ways of getting there's different types of free certificates sometimes there's free certificates that are shared between multiple domains um, sometimes uh, commercial server hosts provide access to a shared certificate that covers everything on its domain so for instance <coughs> um, Heroku uh, you can Heroku is a great place for um, hosting um, node and PHP sites um, <clears throat> every um, um, site created in Heroku is eventually um, well makes use of this shared SSL certificate some server hosts also provide shared certificates that's used by multiple sites within that hosting environment so those are all potential ways that free certificates can happen there's another approach to getting a free certificate, and that's Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt, as it says on, this is a little picture from their homepage, um, uh, it's used on millions of websites. Um, as it says, Let's Encrypt has issued a, uh, a billion certificates. And you might wonder, whoa, how have they done that? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that their certificates are only valid for 90 days at a time. So you uh, as the site owner have to um, um, there, there, you can make use of some tools via the Linux command line um, to uh, add in a new certificate uh, a new one of these let's encrypt certificates but it is work it's uh, it's effort and I guess for really small startups or little things like maybe assignments or things like that where you want to try and have a bit of HTTPS a let's encrypt certificate is just great but um, many sites just find that um, you know the 90 day uh, timeout period is, is a bit of a hassle and will opt to just spend a few hundred dollars to buy one for a whole year or a couple hundred dollars additional to maybe have one for two years all right well I think I'm going to leave off there <laughs>